Okay, I think most people know me by now, but I'll say it again. My name is Alex Tay. Uh, I am privileged to be the CEO of ChiliSoft for the past five years. On behalf of ChiliSoft, ESET, Attack IQ, and Extra Hop, we'd like to extend a really warm welcome to all of you. Thank God it's not raining. Thank God there's no cyclones coming in. So timing's pretty good today uh, for us. Um, uh, we've got an amazing, exciting agenda. Uh, first and foremost, we have the world's best uh, attack simulation vendor uh, presenting, and it's nice to have the boys come in from Australia for that. Um, and then afterwards, we've got, um, in my opinion, the most comprehensive network detection and response product uh, available in the market with the most details in, in the extra hot boys. From there, we're going to just take a five minute break because we are then going to try and attempt some live simulations and so the, the guys just need to um we'll, we'll get a second drink a second beer or something for five minutes and give the guys some time to prep um and then we're actually going to show you some attack simulations on ESET EDR XDR and also a attack simulation on extra hop which is actually my first time seeing as well I'm really looking forward to that um, and then to, to, to round it off, it'd be nice to have a conversational style uh, fire chat with some industry experts around this particular area, which I think will be interesting. Um, thank you, Callum from uh, Two Degrees for uh, managing to come and help us with the fireside chat. We really appreciate that. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to the uh, Attack IQ boys, Simon thank Powell. Thanks, Alex. Hey guys, quick introductions and thanks, Alex and the team at ChiliSoft for hosting. I like the venue. Hopefully easy for you guys to get to, convenient, somewhat different, a little bit, little bit funky, interesting spot. Um, myself, my name's Simon Howe. I'm the regional director for Attack IQ for Asia Pacific and Japan. Sounds like a grand title, sounds like a big area. We're mostly focused on Australia, New Zealand, happy to be here, and our Singapore business. Singapore and ASEAN is where we operate mostly at the moment. Uh, my partner in crime, so to speak, the brains of the operation is Brett Callaghan. He's our technical director, um, also for Asia Pac and Japan. Together, based out of Sydney, we look after the business in this region. Very uh, much represented through the channel, and we thank the channel partners that are here today and through ChiliSoft, that's our value add distributor. So, a couple of minutes from me, but our hands up first. I know we've got a mixed audience of end users, partners, consultants here, those that have heard of Attack IQ. Thanks. Okay, in some small way, I'm not going to ask you to answer any technical questions, Brett can sort those out later. But um, certainly we're growing our awareness and we're growing our uh, capability in region. I'm pointing, I'm pressing, I'm not getting anything. Let me just go manual. Okay, I'm going manual, here we go. So slightly tongue in cheek here, but there are two ways you can test your security controls. Either you can do it or the bad guys can do it. And fundamentally, that's the point of breach and attack simulation is you know, testing your environment to ensure that the security controls you have in place are effective. We're obviously dealing with uh, a landscape today that I don't need to remind you is one of escalating threats, of tool sprawl, of you know, challenges in terms of people and process and configuration. All of that leads to a depreciation in the effectiveness of the security controls. Okay, um, we deal with you know the the most typical, and you're going to hear from some of the best today in Extra Hop and, and ESET in relation to the security controls individually. They're all very effective. Uh, cloud security. So we're obviously testing the typical security controls: your endpoints, your NDR, your network, your you know perimeter and next-gen firewall systems, but also cloud. Cloud security controls for AWS, GCP, and Azure, and obviously aligning the output and the reporting into typical frameworks like PCI, like NIST 853, like the Cori frameworks, like what we're seeing here with NZDISM. Okay. We talk about, excuse my poor navigation of the mouse here, a um, couple of key use cases for us. Obviously, we're testing the security controls. First and foremost, you're getting, you know, are you getting the right value and the right effectiveness out of the security controls in your environment? Um, I tell this story, and Brett's probably 
sort of sick of hearing me use this analogy, but my dad was Royal Navy, British Royal Navy for nearly 50 years. He was very proud of the fact that he was, you know, one of the longest standing officers of the Royal Navy. Um, but only once briefly in active service, 50 years was to his point, always practice, right? testing, you know, was battle readiness as he called it. And that's what Attack IQ is presenting. That's what BAS tools are about, cyber readiness, you know, testing the environment to ensure that in the event of an actual attack, you're going to be capable, your systems are going to be effective, right? Think of it as battle fitness, match fitness. We're not only giving you information. On the specific security controls in order to supporting other aspects of decision. make within the security program where where if you're able to manage it and assess the effectiveness of your security controls what's really working and what's not where do we need to invest differently where do we need to make changes and that is informing the the uh, the security program as a whole obviously and anyone familiar with the term purple team somewhat cyber guys typically are this is where we and you'll see from our uh, collateral and all of the purple thankfully not having to wear the purple suit today but um that's a, a strong part of the attack IQ branding because purple teaming is where you're combining the red teaming attack capability and collaborating with the blue teaming, the defenders that are then, you know, fixing the gaps, if you like, and being able to close that loop and provide almost like a, a continuous uh, optimization process is often referred to as purple teaming. And, you know, that's very much what the platform attack IQ enables. Okay. I mentioned MITRE attack and our alignment in the platform to the known TTPs and APT groups within MITRE, but a couple of really important differentiators for Attack IQ. We're a founding research partner in MITRE's CTID, the Center for Threat Informed Defense. Without going into the, the gory details of that, MITRE is a not-for-profit, as you probably know, but for them to conduct more research, they collaborate with industry and they do that through CTID. So they get together with us smart guys and some other guys with the deep pockets, as you see from the banks up there, and we work with MITRE and with those partners to conduct more research. Examples being, we've just done the stack mappings for AWS, it's Euro GCP. We're looking at mapping CPU, CVE to attack from MITRE, um, mapping uh, NIST 853 stack mappings. So this is work effort we put in that's helping MITRE build out the framework, helping MITRE build out the MITRE attack framework. And of course, that knowledge and that capability feeds down into the platform as well. So that's a unique vendor capability. Uh, none of the other uh, solutions in our space have that kind of relationship with MITRE, and it does obviously make a difference. One final point before we get into the fun stuff and uh, but more of a technical assessment is our academy. Again, something we mentioned because it's the contribution to the cybersecurity community. This is an online, think of it as an online university, a portfolio of on-demand free courses, all related to cybersecurity breach and attack simulation, operationalizing MITRE attack. You'll see it gets as specific as things like FinSIC simulation plans, purple teaming. But all of this is free and on demand. And we encourage everybody to access that university. Anybody can participate. 36,000 now uh, participants worldwide. And something we provide to the cyber community to uplift capability. Okay. So a couple of comments from me. Again, thanks to ChiliSoft and uh, for you guys attending today. And, uh, and now we'll go to Brett for... Uh, some explanation of the platform itself, the architecture, and I think we take a look at the uh, interface as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll, I'm to bring up the... Uh, yeah, that's architecture. perfect, Simon. We'll, we'll try and, and do a demo, but I have a, a really good feeling that it would have logged me out since we set it up. So if not, we'll just talk of the situation and solution. It'll work just fine. Um, so look, Simon talked about the what we do. I want to talk about the how we do it, right? So it's important to note that we are a, what they call a breach and attack simulation platform. Uh, simulation is a very bad term to be used when you start talking about testing control. Simulation is repetitive packet capture, replays, things like that, which tools in today's day and age can essentially learn patterns for and prevent very simply. Attack IQ is an emulation first strategy. So we want to emulate the adversary by running the TTP or the behavior in their environment and determine can the security control pick up that behavior as it's running as a malicious activity and essentially prevent. Um, essentially, the architecture we leverage is client server. So the, the three pieces that are contained within the platform that leverage 
I guess the overall architecture and solution is the management platform, which is cloud-based primarily. We do have a virtual appliance for on-prem. We have an attack IQ Python interpreter, which I'm going to use the term that starts with A called agent. Everyone's going to hate, but it's not an agent. It essentially is a Python interpreter that runs at the user level on the host to execute jobs you assign it. Now, those jobs are the attacks. So we have the management platform as a curation platform. You build whatever attacks you might like to run. When I say build, I mean stack what already existing content exists in the platform, assign it to an asset. The asset runs the test and reports back the findings. Did I, was I successful and able to complete this particular behavior or did something stop me in the way? Alternate to that is once we've determined if you can prevent it or not, is we have an integration manager with integrations with all the known security technologies, uh, whether it be EDR, AV, firewalls, even seam solutions, to identify when detections are made based on the attacks you rendered the platform. So end-to-end, -end, uh, essentially exercise the environment through running real behaviors and TTPs. And then we see the lookup of what detected the event. So what control in my security stack successfully prevented this attack? We're gonna show you where your controls are adding the most value, how far threats are inter in inter intercepting the organization from perimeter right through to asset or you know, inventory, and essentially give you the ability there to either move that attack of prevention outside the organization to the edge, or essentially like a look at what controls you may want to without saying too much rip and replace or maybe uplift in order to get more um, prevention capabilities within it. So we're leveraging those three components to essentially give you a full cycle of uh, attack, detection, and then give you mitigations or how you can solve particular security challenges you might have in your environment. So what you're gonna see from presenters going forward is you're gonna see some results and specific assessments being run against an environment. Um, essentially what we're going to see is the attack component. So a, a management console and an agent leverage to emulate an adversarial behavior. That could download and save a piece of malware. Now we've got malware stored in attack IQ's cloud inventory. We have SMTP servers, so you can send emails to your email gateways to test things like spear phishing attacks, all that kind of stuff. We can also do things like exploits. We can try and see if we can check an exploit, for example, with, huh, let's use Eternal Blue from the WannaCry attack a few years ago. Eternal Blue is a great exploit. Um, runs on SMB version one. We can do a check only and see is SMB version one running on this host or available to be exploited? If yes, we tell you it's a possibility. You can then take the next step and say, okay, now exploit that and go ahead and try and you know, gain access to the machine to SMB version one. Um, essentially having that power and capability in your hands means that you can evaluate is the control able to step in at least from a logging perspective to identify a type of attack ongoing in the environment. There's a couple of ways in which we can help you attack your environment as you being the adversary versus waiting for the adversary to do so. The first is just running TTPs one after the other. We call it atomic testing, which is a static test. Can this particular behavior be successful? That could be something very simple like creating a scheduled task with assumed system privileges. It could be downloading a file and saving it to an endpoint. It could be exfiltrating a file to an external data store. See if your DLP is functioning appropriately. Or alternatively, you can start chaining those attacks together and what we call an attack graph, which essentially is a kill chain or a threat emulation, where you can start from initial access right through to impact and see just at what point during that emulation is your environment able to prevent the adversary from being successful? Where do you stop them and say, okay, go and focus on somebody else because they're going to be easier targets, which is all you're trying to do with the adversary, right? I had conversations since I've been here saying that we want to be 100% effective and preventative. You can try, but if someone focuses on you, you're going to get owned. It's a matter of time. But how you actually push them away is to be deterrent. So if you can keep them away and make them work for their money, they're going to have to go somewhere else because they're looking for quick cash. So essentially, when you see adversaries focusing on you, if you can deter them enough to focus their attention somewhere else, you've won the game. All right? From a detection perspective, and you'll see this in, in one of the demonstrations going forward, you'll notice that we've been to security controls directly or seam solutions to identify when logs have been produced based on the attacks we run. So because we're emulating, we expect the security controls to prevent what we're doing. They should be saying, okay, you're a malicious actor, kill the process, terminate the network session, arrest that file, quarantine the activity. And we'll see that in the form of alerts being produced by that control on the host, sent back to the management console, which we can then interrogate to find those alerts, or alternatively go to the scene where all the logs are paralleled into one place and say, okay, these are my security controls. Which one of these controls provided an alert or a detection based on this type of attack in my environment at this time from this host in this direction? So we can make it a very short, sharp request. And we can populate that in, not from just these vendors, many other vendors, this is just what can fit on the slide, uh, but essentially many other vendors are possible as well. 
So what we provide in a form of architecture to allow for our customers to be successful testing, not just endpoint controls, because when I mentioned the term Python interpreter, local agent, people seem to think that that just means you can test the endpoint control. Well, think of the attack IQ Python interpreter as yourself walking up to a machine with defensive capabilities or offensive capabilities, where you can essentially say, I'm going to connect to a remote host. I'm going to go and interact with the web, download payloads I know when I've got stored in certain locations. I'm going to send data outside the organization. Well, the agent and the associated components that make up the scenario, which is the attack component, can do pretty much anything that you can do from a, from a console or from a keyboard. So we can assume prevention, privilege escalation. We can use regular user accounts to attempt to privilege escalate within the environment and then perform things like lateral movement, RDP sessions to known hosts. We can discover those hosts using tools like Nmap and other things like that. But we can also leverage a very vast environment outside of your organization, which we host and manage to do things like terminate C2 communications, send SMTP based requests or messages and emails to your own mail servers, which may then have email filtering for prevention baked in. We can generate malicious traffic inside and outside your organization. And going back to that simulation word, we can also simulate for those really nasty attacks that involve a lot of network-based interaction. We can actually replay packet captures between two Python interpreters or two agents, one externally hosted by AttackIQ on your behalf and one internally. So you can test your boundary controls, web servers, WAF devices, firewalls, all that kind of stuff to make sure they can identify that malicious traffic and prevent. The same technology, when you move it inside the environment, helps you test things like segmentation, micro-segmentation, lateral movement, where you can pass traffic between two known entities, i.e. the attack IQ agents, safely knowing the source and destination. These could be really nasty attacks that send information all over the place, but because you know the source and destination and it sits within your infrastructure, there's no risk to that data leaking, but you are testing on those really nasty attacks within the perimeter of your, your network bounds. Very important. Now, I'm going to see if we've logged this out of the platform, if we have, we can talk more about it or we can take some questions, uh, but if it hasn't logged us out, we will essentially go straight to a demo. Let's have a look. It did log us out. So we'll leave those guys up and we'll go back to presentation for now. David, did you have that somewhere else? There we go. I got it. All right. Are there any questions about scenarios, attack paths, methods of emulation that you'd like me to go through? Anything about the platform or about what you're seeing in the industry now around penetration testing, red teaming activities, how they form and how they compare to what we're seeing here from Attack IQ? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Essentially, yes, it is. Yeah, it's a checkbox to select the type of technique you want to leverage add and then you can just organize in whatever uh, pathway or whatever order you want them to run in yeah we have a large scenario library yeah four thousand attacks that you can choose from we've got filtering capabilities we have tags against the mitre attack tactics ttp ids threat actors so you can actually choose from a wide range of technologies and threat actors that you might want to see if they're known behaviors or the known attack paths and you can leverage those we also build templates pre-built assessments which there are 158 as of this morning that allow you to, with three clicks, run an emulation that based on a particular adversary, a known campaign or a current campaign operating somewhere in the world that you think may affect you to see how, just how quickly you can deter that threat actor should they focus on yourself. So with the likes of, sorry, go ahead. Running, can you uh, describe mm. it? Yeah, we've got a big red button that says stop all scenario activity so that if you do have a testing mechanism ongoing with the attack IQ platform and a suspected potential real life attack, you could stop all activity and see if that continues to flow through or if it is just remnants of or part of other network activity that's going on all the time. Most definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah perfect. So look, um, with breach attack simulation testing, the BAS platform really is an offensive testing tool in its own right. That's essentially what that definition comes into. When we start talking about security control validation, continuous security testing that Simon mentioned, we start looking at being able to have these exercises not just occur the once like a penetration test or a red team activity, but once you've built a baseline and you're happy with your prevention capabilities, it's all about scheduling that to run every day, every week, every month to make sure that even through traditional change control updates to software, you're not introducing failures. So recent conversation I've had with a couple of customers, I'm not going to name the technology of type, update was processed overnight. The update failed. It completely removed the signature database and all of the heuristics that have been built into their environment just for all their AV components or EDR components. 
And they had no idea until the Attack IQ solution ran the following week after they changed control, picked it up and identified it. They could go back and say, okay, let's reapply the update. Now it's corrected and move on to solving that particular challenge. Um, without the Attack IQ platform testing that, the only way they would have found out was when they reported to you know, the news saying we've been breached and all that data was lost because they had no idea. Yeah, you can do a full year. Yeah, so hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly. Uh, if you wanted to do a once a year activity or if you wanted to do every hour, you can do uptime monitoring of web servers, all that kind of stuff, just through you know, HTTPS URL checking. Or you can do campaigns around testing security control validation to make sure that 100% that you could prevent on day one of cleaning up your environment is still preventing 100% three months down the track every week you validate that point. Yeah, how do you yeah, fantastic question. And 100%. So with other vendors, we actually have technology relationships where we build integration specifically with their tool sets, not to mention taking their intelligence around how their security control should be tested to perform things like default policy validation tests, recommended policy testing to ensure that customers are using the technology correctly, or at least to their bare minimum recommendations. And also to the fact that when customers are deciding to pick up a new technology, maybe looking to switch something or buy something new for their environment, how do you go about doing an evaluation? Traditionally, it's been put one vendor in place, do a few weeks of testing, rip it out, put the next one in. Well, with Attack IQ, you can essentially put all three vendors in place if you're baking off three, put an Attack IQ Python interpreter or agent on each of those machines, run the same test against all three, and you can determine within minutes exactly which one's going to solve your challenges in your environment. Well, look, every vendor, honestly, can prevent just as well as any other, depending on the, the, the let's just, as a blanket statement that I should just walk back from a little bit and say, most of them are fairly consistent across the board. They're different mechanisms, different ways of doing things. As long as they're configured correctly, they can prevent fairly well the same across the board. The biggest differentiator for those vendors is the production environment you deploy them into. There are certain things you want the solution to do, certain things you don't want the solution to do to allow business practices and, and functionality to, to work. So you're going to tune those controls a certain way. The idea of continuous testing is to tune them as best you possibly can for your environment to successfully allow business operations without having a risk profile that you're concerned about all the time. All right, good. We shall move on to the guys at uh, ExtraHop, yes, I think. Thanks very much. Thanks. Hey guys, how you going? Just give me a second. Let me go ahead and see. Can you move the cursor? It's fine. Okay. All right. Most of you guys already know me. My name is Karam. Been working with Extra Hub for the past six plus years, based out of Melbourne. I've got a very strong networking background. Used to work with Cisco, MSCCI Data Center. Used to work with Juniper back in the day. Had really good conversations with one of the customers who used to use Juniper. Uh, our approach at ExtraHop is also a very network-centric approach, uh, which basically means that you know, uh, attack IQ, BAS type solutions who conduct penetration testing, who you know, there's adversaries in real life out there who go ahead and attack your production networks. How do you then go about detecting any of that sort of stuff? That's where ExtraHop really comes into the play. And you know, there's there's obviously the agents that you go ahead and deploy, like ESETs, the EDRs. You've got CrowdStrikes and Silence and Carbon Blacks and everything. Then you've got network-based technology, and you've got logging solutions, right? So you got SIMs, which require logs to be ingested into the platforms like Splunk and Logarithm and IBM Q radars and everything. There's a new thing which is out there in the market, which generally used to be at the perimeter. So it used to be called IDSs or next-gen IDS, which is intrusion detection systems, which is basically a bunch of different rules that you go ahead and write, right? And you know, just like an ACL, if the rule matches, then you've got some sort of an action going on or alerting capabilities. Versus what NDR technology does, which is network detection response, we're basically sniffing the traffic, which is primarily in the east-west corridor. East-west corridor is where your data center's critical assets are. So you know, think about your web servers, think about your message queuing machines, think about your databases like Oracle's and MS SQLs and everything. Think about your backend repositories, which are all basically stitching up an application delivery chain for you to be able to show you what's going on from the network. So protocol fluency of an NDR solution is really, really important. You need to be able to understand what is being said. And basically, as you can imagine in that data center, all of these technologies, they're talking to each other over encrypted protocols. So if 
from a network perspective, you can't decrypt SSL. You can't decrypt Kerberos or NTLM or SMBV3s. You're blind to any of that from a detection standpoint. So hence what ExtraHops NDR does is we're basically sitting in the east-west corridor. You pipe the traffic across to us. Think about spans. Think about ER spans. Think about you know packet brokers, all of that sort of stuff. So it's real life traffic coming in from BAS. You know, a lot of companies go ahead and conduct their pen testing activities all the time. So half yearly, annual basis, you know, they go ahead and keep on doing that. How do you detect those things from the network? Because the key thing, you probably would have heard about that, packets don't lie. Yeah. So you can basically, you know, instrument everything else. There's places that you can't really instrument. So for example, things like these collaboration screens. means IoT devices, any of those sorts of things can't tap them, you can't instrument them, the packets are there. So somehow you can mine those packets in real time to be able to tell you exactly what they're saying. Think about a VoIP phone. You know, you need to be able to parse SIP as a traffic, which is control plane. You need to understand what skinny is. You need to understand, for example, the control plane as well as the bare data plane part of that. If you can parse them from the packet in real time, then you've got a real good understanding of what's going on because then your protocol fluent. So then you've got baselines and from the baselines, you identify deviations and signature matching and everything, right? So that's what ExtraHop does. ExtraHop primarily sits in the data center. You could deploy us anywhere, physical appliances, cloud appliances, think about AWS, Azure, GCP, but we're looking at the network traffic, which is the packet traffic. Then we reconstruct everything in real time. So then we can speak web services. We can, we can talk HTTP. We know what LDAP is. So recent infections like log4j as an example, if there are some Jindy calls in there, those Jindy calls use HTTPS. So to identify, for example, those specific CVEs, you have to be able to decrypt or Kerberos, Cobalt Strike type attacks or Kerberos thing or DC sync, which I'm gonna show you guys. You need to be able to decrypt Kerberos to be able to interpret what is being said. So protocol fluency is one of the key things. Once you've got the protocol fluency, what you're then doing is, you basically want to work with everybody. You've identified that there's a malicious behavior based on you know, different types of vectors. So think about you know, CTI-based information. Here's a public IP comms happening, which is a known bad adversary. So go ahead and start your investigation part of it. Or for example, the second vector could be there's known IOCs, there's known uh, bad behavior about devices. So public CVs, right? What do you do about that? So there's signatures matching. The third thing would be understanding the behavior in your environment. There's a bunch of different IoT devices. You've got wipe phones. This particular wipe phone is deviating from the behavior of the rest of the cluster of the guys. So based on your specific behavior of your enterprise and the devices that you've got in there, then behavior-based anomaly detection is one of the key aspects of an NDR solution. And then the fourth would be you go ahead and write your own stuff. So you know there's minimal information available over the web. You know, there's a zero-day attack. What do you go and do about that? That all information is embedded in the platform. But once you've detected all of that sort of stuff, what do you want to do? Just like, you know, Attack IQ was saying, you need to be able to do some prevention. NDR by nature is passive in nature. So we're purely passive. We're going to sit in the corner, observe everything 24 by 7. But we integrate with everybody. So, you know, the EDR vendors like ESITs and CrowdStrikes and Carbon Black and Silence and everyone. Or, for example, the SIM guys. SIM has now become the next generation SIM which basically means it also has beyond the log ingestion capability, it's got the SOAR capability built into them, which can invoke the playbooks. Go ahead and do a wireless total lookup via an API or something. Make sure that it's not a false positive by doing you know, ABC sorts of actions, and then go ahead and orchestrate something. Orchestrate something on a Palo firewall. Give that policy to the EDR. Do something via Cisco Identity Services Engine because you want to go ahead and block that Wi-Fi device, right? Via 802.1x. So all of those orchestration mechanisms are given to you by the NDR platform. And that's generally what XDR is being called nowadays. XDR is extended detection and response, which basically means all of these three or four things, you need them to have integration capability between themselves. Orchestrate. That orchestration now Gartner is calling intelligent orchestration. That's not TCP resets. That basically is at layer seven, go ahead and give an insight, which is very specific and surgical. So instead of quarantining the endpoint device, why don't you give a specific process, identify that, and give it to the ESET vendor as an example or EDR, tell them to go ahead and quarantine that specific process. Those sorts of intelligent orchestration things are embedded in the platform. 
some of the customers, um, you know, we've been in Australia and New Zealand for the past six years. We got, you know, Callum sitting here, who's, uh, uh, you know, now two degrees. Back in the day, it was Vocus. You know, they've been our customer for the past quite some time. They conduct a lot of pen testing. We've got Countdown, one of the you know biggest retailers that you guys have got out here. They've been using us for the past three years in Australia. You know, we've got thirty plus customers ranging from retail, Woolworths, as an example, Coles, to defense, to federal, to state, to entertainment, Crown Casinos, everybody, anybody who's got any sorts of network detection requirements, they go ahead and use Extra Hub. Uh, by the way, you know, we've got our rep. His name is Damien Lewis. He joined us from Dark Side, Dark Trace, right? Yeah. So he used to work at Dark Trace as an SE. And, uh, you know, he used to be uh, an RSM in there too. So some of the specific things that we've got, we're not necessarily a next-gen IDS. We're basically an NDR platform where protocol fluency is one of the key things. So like encrypted traffic analysis is one of the key things that you have to do. You have to be able to decrypt. And those are some of the things that he was able to see. So how do we get deployed? Very, very easy. We give you sensors. So sensors could be deployed natively in the cloud, AWS, Azure, GCP. If you've got any other, you know, cloud native customers, you know, GCP is one of the key things out there in Australia, as well as Azure, as well as uh, AWS. We can give you cloud native AMIs or VMs or VHD formats that you can deploy in there. We've got 100 gigabit per second census on prem data centers. If you've got that sort of a traffic, we can analyze that at layer seven. And that is unheard of. So, you know, we're unrivaled. Nobody can match that sort of thing along with decryption. So you got, you know, our co-founders basically came from F5, which basically means you know, they sit in the data center. They understand what data center protocol fluency is all about. They understand the scale. They understand the challenges of SSL decryption and Kerberos decryption. So that is what is embedded into the platform. And that's been there from day one. So we started our operations in 2008. That's when the first firmware came out. And, you know, last year, or actually two years ago, we got acquired by two different uh, Crosspoint Capital and Bain Capital Venture Capitalists. So that's what we do. You know, we expanded our presence here in Australia. Uh, and New Zealand region. So we've got 18 altogether. A couple of years ago, we were just two people. So now along with ChiliSoft, you know, the rest of the partners out here, we work uh, with your um, you know, customers like yourselves. So what we do is deploy a sensor, pipe the traffic across to us, and that's pretty much it. So it's very easy to go ahead and instrument it. You know, we're not inline, so we're not going to be blocking the traffic at all. So we just observe. And from the packets, we recreate everything. And then once you've done that, we auto discover everything. So lots of different use cases of the NDR platform because we're not pattern matching. That basically means you don't necessarily have to look into the rules. What if you don't have a rule? What if you, know, you don't know anything about that? So observation of the behavior of the traffic from the packets, packets don't lie, that is very, very critical. So then we auto detect everything. Then we auto classify everything. What are they saying? Is that a database construct? Is that an SMB file share that was being read? All of those sorts of things, we put them in the baselines and show them to you. This is called always on visibility. No agents, nothing at all is required. Pure network traffic, which can't be tampered with. So packets are always going to be there. So that's what our go-to thing is. And it's very easy to deploy. So you've got you know, two data centers. You've got some cloud footprint. We size the sensor. And the sensor's got all of that capability. So Woolworths, as an example, they've got close to 3,000 stores. They've got 17 distribution centers. They've got two data centers. So right now, they started off with data centers, two, 17 of the distribution centers, and they've got close to 10 remote stores in a crash cart sort of an approach with our centers. So we can scale very, very well. Any questions so far before I get into a quick demo? Would you escape that, please? And take me back to the Chrome browser. Yeah, perfect. Sorry, anything at all? NDR, uh, I, I think New Zealand market generally is very familiar with them because you have a lot of dark trace footprint, I'd imagine. So dark trace, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, started off with the whole NDR platform. They're based on Zeek and Bro as part of next gen IDS capability. We play in the same space, but we've got our own platform. And I'll show you some of the differentiators in here. So what happens is generally, if you're an analyst, what you want to do is <clears throat> you want to come in uh, during your shift. And you're like, okay, in the past six hours, show me what's going on. So if you're an analyst, you want to see, you know, in the past six hours, if there's some risk score-based activity, you can go ahead and prioritize that. If you're looking into some cyber kill chain from Lockheed Martin, you can look into that. Who's doing reconnaissance? Who's doing exploitation? Who's doing lateral movement? Any of that stuff, one click away. Prioritization of the workflow is very, very important because, you know, target HVAC compromise happened in 2014. They had FireEye deployed in there, but the analyst could not go through those alerts that were raised during his shift. So workflow prioritization out of the box is very, very critical. 
So then all of these things are based on the discovery and the classification that we've done. So as an example, you want to see quickly who's doing recon, click on that. Right away, you've got the offender and you've got the victim. And all of the information which is relevant to it is embedded in the platform, which means tell me about attack TDP that this, uh, this detection that we picked up, it's observing and associated with that behavior. What is the risk factor of that? What does it visually look like? What is the attack background? So up leveling of the SOC analyst out of the platform is one of the key things that we've got. We give a lot of information and then mitigation controls. What can you do about that sort of stuff? Because we've picked it up now. So, you know, level one analyst, he needs to feed up stuff to level two guys. Or for example, there's a, you know, domain control compromise or something. He needs to go back with relevant information. And that information is available out of the box. Now, before invoking an orchestration play, what you want to do is, you want to see, give me those detection details before I choke the endpoint. So there's a timeline and that is called the attack campaign. How did it come about? What happened T minus one hour, T plus one hour, T plus 30 minutes, whatever, whatever, all of that sort of stuff you can go. And you can look into the specific payload part of that too. So where we, from an NDR perspective, we're not necessarily looking at the headers. We're also uh, analyzing the payload. So think about HTTP, HTTP is just transport. On top of HTTP, you could have JSONs or you could have, for example, XMLs with embedded any of that information in there, right? So we're parsing all of that payload across 75 plus protocols to be able to tell you exactly what's going on. So those snippets are available right there. And we're the only ones, for example, in the market who can do forensics. So continuous packet capture, you know, defense guys, state government guys, you know, they're pretty much into that. They don't want anything to do with the cloud. That's one thing. The other thing is they want forensics. Packets is their go-to place. So these detections, what do you want to do with the packets? We've got that capability that we can go back to 7.5 petabytes worth of packets. So the click workflow would be just go into this detection and say, give me all the packets. Right there in the seamless UI, you've got all of the packets. And because we can decrypt, we can give role-based access, control-based access to the admins who can then download the session keys as well. We can decrypt PFS-based client service sessions, which is a per session per client key. So we can give you that in the packets and you can recreate that, open up in Wireshark, all of that sort of stuff, right? So that's, that's very, very key. Now, what are we doing with these sorts of things, right? What we're doing is we're basically auto-discovering everything. So the detections that were raised to you, four different vectors. You write your own signatures, you've got you know, CTI-based information, you've got behavior-based anomaly detection, and you've got CVs. So what do you do? You're basically discovering, you're doing your inventory out of the box. Tell me what are the MAC addresses during that time frame which are active on the wire. If that's cloud, did somebody spin up an RDS service? Was there an EC2 instance that was spun up that the security team wasn't made aware of? Well, how do you go about it? So you're doing your inventory, your profiles. How many wireless access points do you have? How many wipe points do you have? What are their models and everything? What are they doing? That's the other thing. So always on visibility. You know, this guy seems like he's doing web-based behavior. So tell me 24 by seven, what is he doing? The traffic bites in, bites out part of that. Protocols in, so now see this blank charts right now because at that point in time, he didn't have any traffic. So what do you do? You go back in time, you're like, show me if there was traffic for this guy in the past six hours. And now you've got that one spike. So time series charts of everything is also built. So that means bytes in, bytes out, but protocols, what protocol was he speaking inbound and outbound? What peer devices was he communicating with? As a server, he's behaving as Citrix ICA server. So anybody who uses Citrix for VDI, you've got that information embedded in the platform. And we're parsing those specific things. As a client, he was doing, for example, some database calls. Show me what those database calls were. Yeah, right away, you've got the baselines of responses versus the errors. You've got the user methodology in there too. So what users were invoking any of those calls, all of that information available to you with one single click. So protocol fluency is the other part. So you automatically go ahead and parse. What do you have in the environment? Do you have anybody who's running Telnet? Who's using FTP? Who's using Kerberos? If any of the customers are using Cisco Identity Service Engine as an example, we recently identified that Cisco ICE by mandate uses simple SASL authentication, which means the credentials of the users, the username and the password are being sent across from the users to the LDAP repository from Cisco ICE and ClearText. So, you know, our customers have locked that case with them and they're going to go ahead and publish a CV for that. But those sorts of things, how do you get to know? Because you generally trust your critical assets. You trust your solar winds. You trust your Dell boxes. You trust your HPs. You trust your Cisco's and everything. If they're doing something malicious, how do you pick them up? 
So the network always knows. And that's how you can instrument that in real time. So based upon all of these sorts of things, then we identify those behavior-based detections or anomalies. Here's a MITRE attack map coverage in there. So if the analyst wants to go in and see if there's a specific TTP, which is brute force, or somebody's doing lateral movement or something, how do you go ahead and start your investigation? That MITRE map is embedded in the platform too. You can go ahead and raise tickets, bi-directional incident management with ServiceNow, with Jira. All of that is embedded into the platform natively. Cool, any questions at all? Finally, I'll go on and talk about just the hygiene related aspect. So discovery primarily, but what do you have in there? So think about SSL decryption. Without decryption, we can understand the posture of the assets in your environment. So as an example, what cipher suites do you have? Do you have SLV2s, SLV3s, TLS 1.0s, any of that? Who's talking that? Do you have network printers invoking any of those connections? Do you have expired certs? Banks, as an example, they love this capability because they've got hundreds and thousands of workloads in there, right? How do you go ahead and know what certs deployed on some devices are supposed to expire when? So that capability is embedded in the platform as well. And then basically what you do is, once you've identified these sorts of things in the detections viewpoint, then you go ahead and invoke orchestration. So perimeter view, we give that perimeter view out of the box. So shadow IT type services, who's consuming any of the shadow ITs, yeah? So that's there. If you're an Azure customer, why do you have AWS services? Do you even know you had AWS services? Also, this is a validation of micro-segmentation, just like Attack IT you guys suggested. Also, it's a validation of the fact that your firewall is not necessarily preventing those north-south connections because we're gaining that traffic from within your data center or within your east-west corridor, could be your branch side or something. So the firewall, which should go ahead and prevent, it's not doing that. Cool, so validation is really critical. And the same goes for the network capability. Map everything out. Tell me what you've got in a live activity map. We've got ANU, Unis are a big customer of ours. So recently, you know, we did a big off with one of the competitors, Uni of Melbourne. That's one of the group of eight in Australia. They selected us for the 100 gig capability because they're, they're massive. They've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of switching uh, traffic in there. So they used us and they use this thing. They, they call them constellations, which basically means show me everything that I've got. If there's a, uh, you know, database or an island of connectivity, which I am not aware of, what is that? Show me that. Because the network's going to show you. you. If you don't know about something, you won't be able to instrument it. You won't be able to deploy, for example, a log forwarder on top of that, right? But with network packets, it's always on. It's always, always there. Cool. I'll just pause here. Any questions? Yep. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Yep. So, yep. So again, that's the orchestration part, which Gartner calls intelligent orchestration. So not necessarily TCP reset. So if you're an ESET customer, CrowdStrike or Carbon Black, you've got managed endpoints and you want to go ahead and quarantine them or you via an API. We've got five different outbound interfaces that we can go ahead and use. So think about, for example, REST as an interface. Think about Syslog as an interface. You know, a lot of SOCs have got SIM platforms like Splunks and Logarithms in there. They're, that's their first go-to place to go ahead and see what's going on. So we can pipe anything via that. We can give a policy to Palo Alto's checkpoints. SOAR platforms are very much in play nowadays. So think about, you know, Phantom. Think about Demisto. Demisto is a product of Palo Alto. Phantom is a SOAR platform from Splunk. So they call it, I think, XSOAR nowadays, which basically takes the feeds and detections from different sorts of platforms. So EDRs and NDRs and everything, right? And from them, they can invoke some playbooks. Go ahead and look this up, identify for sure that it's not a false positive, it's true positive, then go ahead and block. All of that work is done via the APIs. So APIs into the XR platform, there are two ways. One is that you can query the extra hop NDR platform from any of your third-party applications. The other part is that we can send using an API based on the information that we gather from the network. Network is AWS, network is cloud, network is on-prem. Anything that we get to see via APIs, we can send that information back to you guys. So provisioning, orchestration of the things, you know, if you wanna use uh, extra hop to orchestrate for thousands of remote sites, we're working with one of the you know, defense customers there in Canberra. They've got you know, satellite sites, they call them deployed locations. So that sort of stuff that they're in thousands 
So they're going to go ahead and deploy them on, for example, VMware or Nutanix. How can you roll them out via an API? There's a bunch of things that they have to do. How can you do that? That's one way. That's using the on-box platform to go ahead and via APIs invoke everything. The other one is, what do you do when you've picked up something from the network? What can you do to quarantine? So five different interfaces, Apache, Kafka, MongoDB, raw TCP, UDB, socket, syslog, and REST. All of those five interfaces can be used outbound to invoke an intelligent orchestrated response. Cool, pleasure. Uh, I'd like to welcome our very own Lukesh uh, presenting an attack IQ simulation on ECDXDR. Awesome, thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, to start things off, um, I wanted to just um, say that we created an assessment uh, using attack IQ to emulate a real life attack on uh, ECDXDR solution. And um, this is uh, for the uh, advanced persistent threat group known as the Sandworm team. And um, the assessment just highlights the different uh, attack scenarios that the um, that we actually go through uh, on the different attack stages. So for example, in the discovery stage, we have scenarios such as running a script to discover like remote systems and um, like gathering network shares and also discovering like say SQL server uh, as examples. Moving forward, um, we also have the persistence stage where we have scenarios aimed at estab establishing like persistence on the machine, such as say um, schedule, uh, like um, establishing a schedule task or uh, setting up a persistence through a startup folder or modifying a registry in the startup folder. Also, just wanted to quick, quickly highlight like these are the capabilities being tested. So uh, on the attack IQ platform, you can easily see uh, it is actually testing the endpoint solution as well as the EDR solution. And uh, furthermore, we have the credential access stage. So we, uh, there's like several scenarios which are like focused on uh, like preventing or uh, looking at dumping uh, or copying of the uh, credentials or the passwords uh, from a said machine. So um, in total, we executed 65 scenarios out of which 63 were prevented successfully, which uh, gives us a 96% of prediction rate. And this is uh, just uh, talking about the traditional endpoint prediction of this day. And um, out of the 65 scenarios, there was two scenarios, uh, such as a create account with a weak password in the persistence stage. And um, another one at the lateral movement stage, which was lateral movement. Through the Win RM tool, which was the advantage of the capability. that are built in that XDR also wants um, so as to like prevent advanced threats threat so um, I'm certainly on the screen right now and uh, if you would notice on the process tree. The attack IQ was creating a CR solution. So there's already a rule in place to such a thing but they have auto remediation in place. As an auto remediation action. Now, uh, what I wanted to do was um, just say I'm a key point player, and they would be looking at the dashboard and this this addiction which uh, gets highlighted or gets is standing out, which is uh, change control window. And um, uh, it highlights when 
Uh, for seen on 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 like and um, given uh, the integration the is a thread enthalpy process or is a python sub process which then is a feed the different uh, uh, like a lot such a uh, suspicious executable in the registry. And then a suspicious executable was actually created in, in this start of uh, folder itself. So establishing like a persistence on the machine itself. And like, like, all the details are clearly visible on the uh, same compromise. A same asking internal case for further investigation. And um, once you raise that, the security analyst, with the help of AI, is presented with an option to add all the related objects, and they can be executable. So um, what I wanted to highlight here was the um, how easy it is for a security analyst to qualify An incident and uh, it into the and uh, let's see how easily you can actually remedy it. the running process uh, and it was actually kill we we get that highlighted on the screen say if this order remediation action was not in place so um, continuing, we can look at the affected machine and all the alarms of the are like the threats and the warning alarms raised on the machine. Then we have uh, a user management using command line, uh, suspicious executable um, being created in the startup folder. So again, uh, just highlighting the persistent stage um, um, that was a part of the attack emulation from attack IQ. And um, then an execution stage alarm is also seen. So there is a known PowerShell command that was actually run. And you can view the whole command in plain, simple text. And again, you can dive further into it, but continuing further with the investigation, we can also see if there's any more uh, order remediation in place. So the process was killed and the module was blocked in this scenario. And um, say if um, there was no order remediation or seeing the multiple alerts, the security analysts can go like, okay, let's not network isolate this machine. Um, so, so that's like I say, a precautionary measure. And doing that is pretty straightforward. Just with a simple couple of clicks, the, net, uh, the machine is isolated from the network, preventing any further like harm to your network or any lateral movement from that machine. And um, moving on to the executable stab. Um, so any objects that you uh, add to the case itself, it's all highlighted. And it, coming from the ESA thread intel feed, it again has a low reputation and popularity score, which again bumps up the suspicious level of the set executables. And um, the Python executable in itself um, did more than 6,000 file modification, 400 network calls. And looking at the attack IQ agent in Solo, they did more than like say 9,000 file modification and eight register changes. And taking this as indicator of compromises and to prevent it from happening again, the security analyst can quickly block the said executable from ever spawning in your own environment. And um, yeah, it is just remarkable how quickly you can investigate and um, have like say mitigation actions in place by the ESA XDR solution, which in turn reduces your mean time to detect and mean time to respond, uh, which overall uh, reduces your uh, like say, all over the risk of uh, like experiencing the high impact cybersecurity incidents. So that's the end of my demo. And before we get to hear from Callum and the rest of the esteemed panel, I'll just quickly go over what we did in terms of this network based attack detection. So this was the policy that we had. So we got internally with an extra hop, any of the customers, we got something which is called cyber rain. So we give access to the customers where they can go ahead and launch their own attacks. It's all 
on base and mom BMZ. Then we had uh, the jumps to part of the you know hostile tools from Mimikatz. It tries to replicate the hashes of the passwords by pretending to be a domain controller. So we executed that. For this to be able to be detected, you have to be able to do Kerberos decryption. So you have to be able to talk to the domain controller, look at that Kerberos traffic, and be able to decrypt it. So from the network, that's what we did. And finally, exfiltration was happening in there. So what we did was, I'll show you some of the stuff in here. So you know, this is one of the jump hosts. Um, you know, you can RDP into those sorts of things, and that action would be picked up over the network right away. So I'll take you back to ExtraHop as a console. This is the console that we've got. So from a detection standpoint, you can pivot to the time frame that you've got. Go if if you are into detections, click on detections right away. From the detections, and let me zoom in. Yep. You can see, for example, in the past one day, when we simulated this attack, what basically transpired over the network. You can see, for example, remote services were launched. You can see LDAP invalid credentials detection was raised. You can see there was a specific zero logon CVE. That's, that's a known bad thing. IOCs are there, CVEs are there. So that detection was raised. There's some over SMB as a network file sharing protocol. Some commands over, uh, were sent across from a device from one client to a server. So those things we picked over the network because we can parse SMB. So, you know, you've got map network rise, click on them. The moment you go ahead and click, it establishes a control session with your SMB or NFS repositories. Then you can create devices, folders, files in there. You can read from them. So unless you parse those protocols, you would not be able to pick it up. But we picked everything up, right? So as an example, if you go in there and you want to go ahead and uh, look into a specific T0 detection, so DC sync. What it tells you, you know, why did we pick it up? Who are the offenders? Who are the victims in there? And this is really key. This is behavior-based understanding, right? So remember the four vectors that I identified to you? So one is obviously the CTI, known bad IP addresses, known bad domains, or on a watch list of some kind. We've got our own curated threat intel. Beyond that, you've got CVs. You've got, you know, known IOCs, bad IOCs that you can use. You're writing right here. So you can see, we know that this guy offender over the network, we've never seen him and we expected the value to be zero. So the whole idea of a SOC analyst is that based on the behavior-based differentiation, we want to surface that, bring it to the fore to you guys so that you can then say, is it a true positive or a false positive? But you need to know the behavior for that. You can only identify the behavior of those things if you know what they're speaking. So if you don't know these protocols, if you don't know what LDAP is, you don't know what Kerberos is, you can't extract the right metadata from the packets, then you won't be able to pick it up. So then you're stitching the timeframes. So you're like, okay, what happened primarily? So T minus 18 minutes, there was a CV, which was this. You click on that, you've got all the relevant information, the records extracted from the packets. You've got, okay, who are the parties involved in there? What payload part of it did we go ahead and extract? And give me packets. So if you're into packets, you're like, this is what it is. This is bad stuff, right? I'm going to go ahead and produce that as evidence in the court. Click on the packets for that specific detection right there. You've got all of the packets. Download the PCAP, open it up in Wireshark, put it up in a sandbox environment, do whatever you want with that. So it's very, very quick. And then you go back to that thing. You can go through the stages of things, right? What did I do afterwards? So LDAP invalid credentials. So LDAP invalid credentials, who are the parties in all? That was a jump server talking across a domain controller. You know, for the analyst, what does that mean? What is the relevant TTPs associated with that? All of that information embedded right here. So one comprehensive page tells you, we call it enhanced detection card. So without you or the analyst going Google, you know, tell me this or nowadays chat GPT, tell me what that thing is all about. You can see all of that into, um, you know, the extra hop UI. And then you can invoke all of the actions that you wanted to. But all of this was detected primarily because of auto discovery on auto classification of behaviors. So that's right here. So you can see, for example, in that environment where you have the PCs and everything, you can see what devices are we discovering? What are their models, if any at all? You can associate description with them. What are the subnets? What are the MAC addresses? You know, when did they wake up all over the network? You've got all of that information. And then what you can do is you can create dynamic device groups. So you can say, let me go ahead and create the dynamic device group based on the user's subnet and give it a software. So if that is running Windows 7 or something or Windows X, XP, hopefully not. But if you're running any of that, tell me what devices in my environment have that. 
and you create these dynamic device groups. And then what you can do is you can see from auto classification aspect of things in that environment, what are they doing? What is the database call that they're requiring? I just opened up an RDP session. So click on RDP, remote desktop protocol. Remote desktop protocol can also be SSL encrypted. So again, if you can't decrypt, you won't be able to see, for example, the versions or the, you know, the bandwidth or the resolution that somebody's requested or the usernames which are being passed inside of that RDP session. We can decrypt all of that. And then you've got very specific features of that, right? So as an example, right here, if I go back into the past 15 minutes, I can see right here, I open up, look at this, this RDP session that I open up, right away, we've got that one interaction extracted over the network. Without you relying on anything, no agents, none of that sort of stuff is required, the network already knows. So if you can mine the network in real time with the relevant protocol decodes, you would know the network's the evidence. And then you can see, okay, who opened that? Tell me, give me all the records. You know, besides being a server, which is exposing RDP, He's doing SIFs, he's got some file shares, he's, he's behaving as a DNS server. So you map everything out from the network and then you put this behavior you know, to your machine learning engines, which is the AI part of it. And then you identify the deviations from it. Cool. Thank you very much with this. Pass it across to you. So it's been five years since I've been back in New Zealand selling a whole heap of these products, XDR, EDR, Seams. NDRs, it seems like we are selling loads and loads of analytics products. My first question is to a true customer, Callum, you use all these products. Have you actually found them to be useful in an operational environment and why so? Uh, yes, we, we find these tools very, very useful. The, uh, the amount of detections that are true that come out of these uh, these products are so useful. The incident response can take forever if you don't have access to the right information. Um, and just like you were showing, the uh, having all that information on the same page means your analyst isn't off Googling. Um, you know, they're not having to do an IP lookup. They're not doing all these menial tasks. Um, all the information is there. And it makes um, for a much more expedited report, <laughs> basically, mm -hmm. um, and and hopefully stop whatever the bad thing was. Yeah, and and in your opinion, <clears throat> time does matter. How I'm, quickly you are, how, at what important. stage, and how quickly you are detecting that cyber attacker matters. Yes, uh, I mean there's. There's uh, reports come out recently that said um, when Mr. Bad Guy gets in, if uh, he's in there for more than 15 minutes, uh, you're in for a bad time because he's going to start moving later on. Uh, and getting that dwell time down is your, your biggest sort of task. having the, the SOC jump on an alert that comes through straight away and being able to... SP services, um, and you're running these tools and you know, you're now pretty well versed in these tools, how how, you know, what's your opinion on these things? Yeah. Is it from um, my perspective, at least, um, it augments or enhances the capabilities to detect. But the traditional endpoint protection, you don't have things like cloud analytics, uh, machine learning. So those are really things that gives you that extra layer of visibility that you don't previously had. And um, like Callum has said, so that gives you a much more workable data. It doesn't give you a long fatigue. You don't need to manually go and investigate um, incidents. So it just brings down that, that time to detect and time to remediate uh, so much down that it's actually workable for a small SOC team that we would sort of have in New Zealand. Because most of these SOC teams are, I would say, between five and 10 people at most. And we don't have the large capacity of countries like um, Australia or the States or Europe and so on. Excellent.
Um, and Kurt, you've obviously been an extra hot now for five years, six, six plus, six plus really. time flies. Uh, you've obviously had this product deployed all over Australia and New Zealand. You've worked specifically with a lot of security operations center teams. Give us a real world example um, of um, extra hot and the NDR really providing serious value in terms of quickness of detection. Absolutely. Um, and, and what happened? Like, were they appreciative of your work? <laughs> So uh, very good question again. So one of the key things that we've identified by engaging with these sorts of customers is that just like I mentioned, packets don't lie. Uh, logs, if you, if you think, if you're a web admin, what do you have to do? You have to go ahead and configure an Apache log on that, right? Because you want specific attributes to be piped across to you. If you're a security admin, then you have to go ahead and on the same Apache instance, you have to configure specific logs, which make sense to the security guys, yeah? Packets contain all of that information out of the box. So the moment you go ahead and tap into the packets, you've got that data set normalized. So what our customers have basically seen is generally in Australia, you know, out here in New Zealand, you know, customers are really, really, you know, they go ahead and talk to each other. In Australia, that's not necessarily unfortunately the case. So, you know, big organizations, the apps team would not talk to, for example, the security guys. The security guys would not talk to the networking guys. So there's those silos. Extra Hub has been able to plug these gaps and get people talking. So they're more collaborative, primarily because of the fact that we're looking at the packets. So the same packets that the security guy gets analytics from, those same packets provide value to a database app. It provides value to a web admin. So then all of these guys are talking. So it's not just SecOps that most of our customers use us for. You know, go, going back in time. So if something was launched today as a zero day attack, you've got some sort of IOCs available. Can you go back in time and when there was no rule to match a next gen IDS example, or for example, an ACL type of an example, which is generally layer three and layer four, can you go back in time and see how was this device performing? That's, I think, the most value that our customers get from our platform. It's obviously the scale. It's, you know, areas that you can't tap into, like, you know, decryption part of it. Those are blind spots to a lot of organizations and they don't even know what's there. So auto discovering everything, identifying what they're saying, and then covering those blind spots with these decryption-like technologies to create a baseline and get people talking is what I think most of the customers credit us with. They're like, you know, everybody uses the platform. It's not just us security guys. And some of the use cases, which are very centric, which is like, you know, there's, there's an attribute, you know, you guys threw out something which is called mean time to detection. There's also one which is called mean time to innocence. Is it my fault? Is it your fault? <laughs> you know, those things, how can you absolve yourselves off of it? The packets, again, don't lie. <laughs> Surely tech guys <laughs> point fingers <laughs> everywhere. <day. laughs> um, Simon, for our sins, we, we, you know, in your previous life, we've been selling scenes for five, six years, all across, successfully all across Australia and New Zealand. Yep. Now at the Tech IQ, uh, you know, give us some visibility on how, from a BAS perspective, you're able to prove that some of the investment people have made uh, ha has really delivered value. Yeah, and that's a, and that's a great question. And yeah, thank you for putting up with those eight years of of logarithm selling scene. But um, certainly a, a, a new world, a new subject matter with the TAC IQ, and hopefully something that is also uh, resonating with either you as customers or as partners, as you as you're considering. Um, a more modern security program. Um, the concept, obviously, of, of, of testing your systems has, has, always, has always been there. You know, the notion that all of these uh, fantastic investments that you've made in an array of security technologies, the need to test them has always been there. But traditionally, that's been a manual process. You know, within some of the large enterprise banks that we deal with, for example, there are you know, red teams and blue teams, you know, people hands on actually performing these tests and performing these emulations. You know, Really, what we're seeing is a, a modernization of that to an automated approach, right? You know, you simply really can't be testing enough manually. You can't be doing pen tests all the time. You can't be doing red teaming exercises all the time. And those point in time approaches are just that. They're a point in time. And within a day, a week, a month, six months, a year later, you know, that information is out of date. So this today, the few organizations are looking for a more uh, modern approach to automate and, and enable that testing 
and on a continuous basis, you know, to be able to continuously test systems, to test them against all known adversaries. You know, let's get the let's get the computer to do it. We don't need, you know, hands and feet, you know, getting involved in that. We can actually automate this through vast platforms. So that's what's resonating with enterprises today is understanding that through that automation and technology, they can verify and validate the effectiveness of the security program. In some cases, and we talk about what's called BVAs, you know, business value assessments, we're literally looking at, you know, spend on, on specific security controls, mapping that to the percentage effectiveness and saying, well, right now, you know, X hundred thousand dollars of your investment is effectively, you know, not working for you, you know, so let's, and it starts to put some of the, um, you know, some of that into sort of dollars and cents perspective as well, but it's, it's helpful and it's real evidence, frankly, that the CISO can then take to the board and that's very helpful. Anyone can buy a Lamborghini or a Porsche, but if you don't know how to drive it properly, it's no use, is it? So, um, you know, so so to hate to put you on the spot here, but uh, as a cybersecurity specialist organization, when there is a known attack like Log4j or something like that that's new and buzzing around the industry, how quickly can Attack IQ uh, yeah. uh, put together yeah. a simulation yeah. that can that can prove to an organization like two degrees mm. that they're not infected by that particular new yeah. attack? Yeah, great, you know, great question. Uh, and a couple of ways to answer that. You know, firstly, um, through, our, through our labs teams, our adversary you know, research teams, um, we're maintaining the, uh, the data within the platform, you know, the content within the platform you know, very quickly. It's within a few hours, we could be updating uh, new blueprints and templates to to you know to test particular attack scenarios. So obviously we're staying current with that, but typically we're doing that in order to just uh, template and provide sort of ease of use into the platform. Because fundamentally, if we take log push as a good example, Colonial is another example. Typically, the the methods and methodologies, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that those adversaries are using are the same. You know, they're they're not fundamentally typically you know entirely different techniques. So, you know, the reality is from a zero day perspective, you know, as long as you're testing the environment against those known TTPs, you know, you're highly likely to be strengthening the resiliency of your environment to those zero days anyway. A new exploit might, a new vulnerability might be discovered or a new exploit, but typically the tactics, techniques and procedures that the adversary is using, adversary is using are the same, right? So if you know you're testing against those TTPs, then you know, regardless of what's coming, new or otherwise, you know, you're going to be in a stronger position. Right? Hence my tech framework, right? Yeah. Um, so, Callum, uh, another question for you. Um, look, uh, how often do you guys do pen tests uh, currently? Uh, so we are required to do pen tests uh, at minimum once a year, um, but we often do every six months. Um, we've been lucky to have uh, extra hop in the network uh so when we have done these pen tests uh lights up like a christmas tree we've been able to shoulder tap the pen tester and say you've been caught uh within the so, blue team actually won yeah yeah <laughs> within within five minutes we have uh identified down to his network port and shut him off uh yeah it's it's a great tool excellent um and in those in those um pen testing scenarios do you think that if you were able to pen test is it a lot of work is you know if you're able to test more often would you or is it is it just a pain in the ass to the SOC team it's just about money right it's expensive and again time? well because we are required to use third party external of course pen testers um for part of our certifications uh and it is money so we do actually have a red team within uh within my purview the, the oh, you do? yeah okay. um we're still new and getting there uh and in my old life they used to call me the chaos monkey uh, because i would break things <laughs> a lot uh in my own uh sort of red teaming yeah um so yeah we, we do test a lot yeah whether involuntary or not yeah. <laughs> Before I get on to my next question, do we have any interesting questions from the audience? Phil, Jason? I don't know. No, go for it. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait a second. I don't want to hog the line. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Simon. I'm interested to know 
what type of organizations are buying attack iq in new zealand and who within those organizations are buying them great question great question and i'll, I'll speak to new zealand specifically i'll speak to australia and just you know to the marketplace in general certainly i would say it's fair to say that it's been uh, uh, largely taken up in the towards the enterprise end of town you know not specifically financial services, but financial services very active in that space and probably sort of leading the charge. Uh, but then beyond that, you know, critical infrastructure, government, healthcare, education, typically larger organizations with, you know, discerning and advanced security programs are now folding in VAS uh, formally into their security programs. It's on the, it's on their plan, it's in their, you know, it's on their radar, it's something they're doing. Um, to add additional color to that. It's not something they weren't doing before entirely. It's just something that they now need automation and technology around. It's simply something they might have had red and blue teams, even purple teaming exercises wrapped around. And it's something that is going into those organizations to make them more efficient and to augment those teams, right? What we're now starting to see though as well is um, organizations with smaller security teams trying to do more recognizing of course they don't have the resources to be you know perform manually performing you know red teaming and blue teaming and looking again at a platform play to automate that and something like attack iq certainly doesn't and bastos in general they don't dispense entirely with the need for pen test you know if you look at two degrees you've often got a requirement to externally pen test as well so they they you know they are complementary however you're able to um very efficiently test your security controls, really, really, uh, I guess, elevate and test the, your security program very efficiently with a tool like that. All of the out of the box content enables you to do a whole way with even a single user. I take an example of uh, Lionco in Australia, um, CISO plus, you know, an in, one individual threat intelligence. Company. So for, for them, the decision about Attack IQ was, do I hire two more people or do I buy a platform that the you know threat intel guy could use? And that's what they've decided to. They've taken a technology play to augment that team and save them having to hire resources. Again, now of course let's think about the resource issue in general. There aren't a lot of people out there, even if you could you know afford to afford to hire them. There's a, you know a, a dearth of, of expertise. You know there aren't enough people out there. So again, a technology play is it's very relevant. In New Zealand, banking sector, ASB is a customer. Uh, minor 10 is a customer and the pipeline reflects something similar in terms of banking and finance, government, healthcare and education. Right. And, and Simon, how, how do you see MSSPs and, and, and the partner channel working with uh, Attack IQ on, on your technology? Yeah, and that's a, a, another, another good question that we recognise in the New Zealand market, in the Australia market, in Asia Pac that I, that I cover in general, that's a very important part of how um, you know, how the market needs to be addressed. You know, at the moment, we're focused on a, uh, a more, I would say, a, a typical model where the customer has the platform and partners are wrapping services and wrapping uh, expertise around that. Not a formal MSSP program, if you like, but certainly we're seeing customers require that support and require that additional services from partners. And really, any, any partner conversation we're having uh, reflects that services opportunity for the partner as well. So, so partners have been using agents and moving uh, those agents around different yeah. customers and providing simulation yeah, accordingly, or, or for and example, hence then providing reporting. Yeah, exactly. Or, for example, a particular customer will want to augment their own capability with that partner's capability to be conducting the attack scenarios, to be running the reports, to be effectively operationalizing the platform for them. And that's something we quite typically see. Again, customers need the technology, and they're also typically looking for somebody to help them look after it. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And I think I, the end of your question, Jason, actually was around who in the organizations we're selling to. And that, and that does tend to vary depending on the size of the team. Typically, obviously, it's the, the security or cyber folks in a lean team. And I gave the example of, of Lion. You know, that was the CISO and the, the threat intel guy. In a larger environment like an ASP or a Westpac or something like that, then we're dealing with the typically and very often the red teams or the red team and blue teams, or what's often called the dark teams, detection and response teams. It's that that community. Great question, thank you. Any other questions from the audience before I move on? No? Good. Um, let's move on to, Piro, you, you briefly touched on automation, AI, helping in these scenarios. Can you explain if and how 
these capabilities have, have improved in the last five years? And, and, and Kurum, you can go after Piero. Um, you know, tell us how extra hot, for example, you talked to me about machine learning and AI five years ago. What improvements have you guys made? So Piero, over to you first. Yeah. I think key at the moment is speed and automation. So how quickly can you detect um, if there's been a, some sort of security breach? Now, traditionally, you have to go and manually investigate that incident. You have to look at your firewall logs. You have to look at your server logs and then correlate that manually. Nowadays, um, with uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence and cloud intelligence and things like that, you can automate most of that. And that greatly increases your speed to one, identify a, a security incident and then potentially remediate um, that, that, um, that incident. So it's come a long way. And you can see, sort of see only from, I think, uh, just looking at the last three years, you can see it's really um, matured a lot from what it was. Like I said, um, just going back just a short um, space of time, uh, most of that had to be done manually. Sure. And from my perspective, I think um, when I look at look back at Extra Hop almost five years ago, I'd say, that's when we launched our first machine learning instance. Why did we actually launch machine learning? It was primarily because of the fact that we could see out there in the customer space, there's a lot of data that we go ahead and extract. Packets are rich. If you identify, for example, 5,000 attributes at scale of 100 gigabits per second, you can't use on-box technologies to go ahead and learn the behaviors of things. So now you're talking about, you know, I'll give you an example of Uni Melbourne. We did a recent bake-off uh, and, you know, that's where pen testing was one of the key things in there too. But they've got 100,000 plus devices in one of the environments they actually piped across to us. And the traffic, we could see a peak of 72 gigabits per second. That was all of the traffic in that one specific location. They've got hundreds of thousands of routers and switches and everything, right? And people don't even know what's there. And so now we're picking up Raspberry Pis. We're picking up web phones. We're picking up, you know, back in the day, I used to work with Cisco. Uh, Uni Melbourne was one of my customers. They were one of the biggest ones in Victoria State. So they had close to 3,000 wireless access points. Think about, you know, the amount of students that go ahead and connect. And they had, you know, wireless access points providing guest Wi-Fi connectivity to people who are crossing, for example, train, uh, train station pathways. So all of those devices, they appear on the network. Now, if you're extracting from the packets, hundreds of thousands of devices, their attributes, how do you identify the behavior on box? That's the key thing why Extra Hall five years ago launched the machine learning, not on box, in the cloud. Now, what does machine learning do? Machine learning basically is a bunch of algorithms, you know, really smart engineers have written. What they're doing is they're looking at a complicated set of attributes. Yep. So they're looking at, for example, if I use a protocol, RDP as an example, to go ahead and log into something, what time of the day do I use to go ahead and log in at? So if I'm logging in generally, you know, nine to five, suddenly I start logging in at one o'clock in the morning. That's a behavior-based deviation off that specific user on that specific MAC address and IP address. So you've got lots of attributes to go ahead and process. That's why scale for thousands of analytics or metadata that we extract at scale and speed can only be done right in the cloud. And what does it do? You know, those algorithms, you know, they could look like predictive analytics. Uh, you know, you're looking at, uh, uh, you're looking at clustering based techniques mm -hmm. where what you do is you've got IoT devices like wipe phones, I'll take an example of that. Why is this wipe phone differentiating in its behavior from somebody else? Because generally what you do is you go ahead and write a signature. So on a firewall at a layer three boundary or something, if you've got a routed network, what you do is you say, okay, that's a wipe device. You know, it's got video in there. So it's going to go ahead and transact, you know, megabytes worth of information. Yeah. Or megabits per second. So I want to go ahead and set a threshold. If I don't understand the layer seven semantics of it, which means that's an RTP bear call. So data is going to consume a lot more, right? So if there was a firewall rule that you have to write, then you're stuck to thresholds. So thresholds are not necessarily you know, very good. They're not high fidelity, they're noisy. So that's where behavior analytics from that protocol angle comes into play. So clustering techniques, peer group analysis, deep learning, all of those hundreds of thousands of algorithms basically run in the cloud over thousands and thousands of devices, extracting all of those attributes, and then they give you high fidelity detections because noise, I mean, again, you know, you want to do away with noise, right? 
You want to increase your signal to noise ratio. Fidelity of your signal needs to be better. And machine learning is going to be noisy. You've got a small data set. You've got a large data set and you've got really good algorithms. Your machine learning is going to be really good. False positives can be very expensive and timely, can't they? <laughs> um, look, from a customer perspective, Callum, you know, where can these vendors go from here to make your job easier, in your opinion? That's a tough one. Yeah. I know there's a few sock managers and people that run socks in this room or will be, uh, you know, feel free to, to provide any input. Just a, well, a couple of thoughts based on what you guys were saying. Um, I mean, we, we are mandated, we have to get the uh, external pen test done. But the people that we give those reports to, they would much rather that pen test come back and say, everything is fine, than but here's all the things we found. So having your constant uh, you know, attack uh, simulation, yeah, yeah. simulation to, yeah. to find all those holes and plug them. So when you finally get your pen test done, there shouldn't be any findings, or at least very little. Um, so that's where I see your sort of product fitting in. Um, and then we've got I think, people like uh, Extra Hop, who you think is a security appliance, but it's a lot more than that. I come from an IT background. I used to be one of the architects for, for IT. And I still help out a little bit with the IT world. And we've just gone through a major merger to companies, uh, IT teams that could, you know, one team could see one half of the network, the other team could see the other half, and they're trying to make everything work. Uh, and they spent months trying to get our Active Directory to work so we could make all the internal applications talk to each other nicely and have all our people in the same environment uh, and the the project managers were getting a bit angry because things weren't working and stuff was taking a long time and I jumped onto extra hop and dug around in there and found out they were missing an SBN within say, 15 minutes I fixed their problem and everything was happy again wow so that was you know, that's an operational thing. That's not some, That's not a security thing. That SPN being not there isn't my problem, but the operations team were very happy to, to know that that was missing. Uh, SQL, the, it, it, having it decrypt all the SQL uh, queries. Um, oftentimes I've gone to the, to the database team and said, do you know this query that you're running is taking 30 hours to run? And they're like, Oh my God, <laughs> that's why the server is tanking. <laughs> um, yeah, just information like that, yeah. that you wouldn't expect to come out of a security device. It's there, it's very useful. Like you said, the packets don't lie. And there is a lot of different teams within the company that uh, benefit from having that mm. inside the network. You just did someone out of the service sale in Ingram or something like that. I think so. I'm not that. Um, cool. Does anybody else wants to share something before we, we conclude? Yeah, maybe, maybe just to add on what Colin has said. So um, I think a lot of companies, uh, people, what they call it, they've got a, like a false sense of security. You've got all these security products that you've got, but if you don't test them and don't thoroughly test them, you don't really know whether they've configured correctly, have they configured uh, according to best practice, have they been set up specifically to your environment, you know? software changes, like Kuruma said, then uh, something might break. You also got staff turnover. Now, what's important, what the other one administrator or security analyst uh, rules and uh, uh, whatever is put in place in those security systems might have been removed by the new person that came in. And if you don't continue to test, you wouldn't know whether you're still there, whether you're still protected. And that's why it's so important. I <laughs> Cool. Anybody else want to share anything? Just one quick question. Yes, Phil. Mm -hmm. um, for technology uh, like Extra Hop, I could see that working quite straightforward in a straightforward network environment. Now, if you had a complex enterprise environment, you really see people. Does it Hello. A, <laughs> what, what's the deployment like in that? Is it, is it a nightmare? Are you spanning forms everywhere and boxes everywhere? Or how does it work? Uh, it's about finding 
uh, you're never going to get 100% coverage. Um, but you just find the places where you can uh, get the most coverage. We pump in uh, anything that's coming in and out of an office goes into a unit. Um, and then in core um, data centers, uh, we, we look for the VLANs that are going to give us the, the most useful sort of traffic. Um, and then, yeah, we just, we do VLAN taps, we do physical taps. Um, I've got ER spans running the country. I've, you know, I'm tapping Christchurch all the way up to Auckland. Um, yeah, we just pipe data from wherever you can to these devices and they've got multiple interfaces. So, yeah. It, it, it can be a challenge, but it, everything is solvable. Um, tap aggregator switches, anything you can to sort of condense that traffic down and, and filter out the stuff you don't need. Generally speaking, what our customers mostly do is they would start off from their data centers. So data center is obviously where the critical assets are. So they would go ahead and you know have a look at the core switch. If you don't have any tab aggregation like you know Gigamon or Ixia or Garland or Arista for that matter, then you just span the traffic from one or two core switches. Traffic coming in, going out, as well as your east-west corridor. That's going to give you probably, I'd say, 70% of the coverage. Then based on the information, the analytics that you've gathered over time, then you've rolled it out. For remote sites, think about retailers, think about Coles and Countdown and all of these guys. They've got a very crash cart sort of an approach. What they would do is they would go ahead and deploy a sensor, a physical shoebox size, or maybe a VM in those stores. Um, you know, crash cart probably would be go ahead and identify stuff, fix everything, and then, you know, spin it down, take it to another store sort of a thing. Some critical stores where transactions are high, for retail as an example, then they would have dedicated appliances in there. Uh, and don't just say it's on-prem only, right? So think about cloud as an example, AWS or Azure or GCP. You can have dedicated sensors in there. Uh, for AWS, uh, they've got native packet mirroring technologies. Uh, they're called VPC packet mirrors or you know packet mirror generally. It's called VTAP or VNTAP uh, from a generic uh, topology perspective. You can also, we can also go ahead and ingest logs. So VPC flow logs within AWS or on-prem NetFlow type logs, we can go ahead and ingest them. But that's going to give you only layer four visibility, layer two, layer three, layer four. For layer seven, you have to look into the packets. So cloud has been you know, able to instrument that. Generally, for customers like yourself, they would start from the data centers. And if you don't have any packet brokers, you eventually would get packet brokers for the data centers because of the scale, because the sheer amount of the traffic and the tasks that you have to go in and play. And then roll it out to your distribution centers or your remote sites or regional offices. That's generally what the approach would be. He, there's uh, one other thing. Um, if you can't tap the network and you can't, you know, get that traffic, there's always the the remote RDP cap. RP cap. RP cap. Yep. Um, throw that on on important servers, uh, on your VPN servers, on you know your domain controllers. If you can't physically tap them, throw that on. Pipe it all straight to Xdrop. From start to finish, Callum, how, how long did you say it took you to deploy extra hot to a state where it was useful as it is today? Very short. Um, obviously, there's always the uh, change control and unplugging cables and all that kind of stuff. But once you've got your taps in place, um, you know, you have the power on the box, you plug it in, you lift it, and off you go. That concludes. We did finish a bit early today. Uh, thanks again. If you do have any questions, please uh, lead them. Uh, once again, thank you very much for bearing with us uh, and joining us. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties we had earlier on. Uh, I think we had a little bit of a power spike happen here that disconnected us. Uh, again, thank you very much for joining us.